Come on, put those hands together. Come on. Has the Lord been good to you? Stand up on your feet and put those hands together. Come on. How many of you know that as long as I got King Jesus, he will help me to hold out? Come on.
Providence Church family and all of you who are listening this morning online or wherever you may be across the country or wherever you have keyed in and you're wa watching us by the streaming service that we offer here at Lake Providence Baptist Church. I want you to know that we are uh, celebrating on this Sunday uh, our 152nd homecoming and church anniversary. This is the first year that we won't have the fried chicken, the ham, the mac and cheese, and the green beans, and the apples, and all those wonderful desserts that we share together normally. But I hope that each one of you have are celebrating in your homes a wonderful meal with one another, but remembering that the church is not the building. We miss the fellowship with one another for sure. But the church is in our hearts, and we're going to remember to continue to praise God in spite of what we're going through right now as far as the, ch the church is concerned. I do believe that there are things that God does sometimes that he upsets our comfort zone. And when he upsets our comfort zone, it only pushes us to a greater degree of ministry as we reach out to the community in which we serve and our state. And now, not only our state and our city, but around the nation where anyone who chooses to do so can become a part of the worship experience here at Lake Providence Baptist Church. I want us to realize that we do have a theme for this year as far as our homecoming and church anniversary celebration is concerned. Hope is our anchor. That's what we will be keying in on as far as our homecoming celebration is concerned. So we want you to know that we are praying with you, we are praying for you as we celebrate 152 years of service. We want everyone out there too, if you are unchurched, if you know not the Christ, we welcome you to Lake Providence through and by candidate for baptism, Christian experience, or uh, uh, letter, a transfer of membership into our church fellowship. We ask that you just key in to the area that is on our website and fill out the information, send it in to us. For those who have joined during this pandemic, we say welcome to Lake Providence Baptist Church. We are looking forward one day in the future, somewhere in the future, to meeting all of you and extending that hand of fellowship into our congregation. I want our church family to please be in prayer for those who have lost loved ones during the course of this week. On uh, this week, we celebrated the life of Brother Sam Howard with his immediate family who was here. We are still in prayer for them as they go through this process of grief and time of mourning. We are also in prayer for our own sister Monica Satterwhite, whose mother passed away, and she was funeralized on Thursday of this week. Sister Patsy Beverly Smith, in the loss of her sister, who was funeralized this week also. Also, Brother Michael Moore, who lost his mother, and she was funeralized this week also in Selma, Alabama. Brother Robert Turner, in the loss of his nephew, who will be funeralized uh, uh, this, uh, who is, who it will be funeralized this week also. And then uh, Brother Bruce Robinson and Sister Sabrina Sullivan, in the loss of uh, Sabrina's granddaughter who passed away. We want, we do not have the exact time or location of her life celebration as of yet, but when those uh, uh, particular information comes along concerning, when that particular information comes along, we will send it out through email and we want us to please remember all of them in our prayers as we go forward. Let us pray. Father, we come before your presence again, thanking you, O oh Heavenly Father, for 152 years of ministry in our community of Lake Providence, and then expanding that to the Davidson County and surrounding county areas, and then even expanding that 
as we have those now who key into our services throughout our land and country and around the world. And we're praying, O oh Heavenly Father, as you increase the ministry, because the command was given a long time ago, that you will be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so for therefore, Heavenly Father, we are striving just to live out the commitment of your will as far as ministry is concerned. Help us always to keep before your people that Christ is the only answer for sin. Help them to understand that he is the only means of salvation and it is through and by him and his precious blood that was shed on Calvary's cross that we are covered in his blood. And when you see us, you see us as the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Thank you for his sacrifice. Now, Heavenly Father, bless the message. Bless those who will hear it, O Lord. May it be sown in fertile ground that it may produce and that it may, O Heavenly Father, touch hearts, Touch minds that we may continue, O oh Heavenly Father, to advance your kingdom here on this earth. Hide now again this, your servant, behind the cross, that those who hear today shall see thee and not me. Let the words of my mouth now and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You who are our strength and our Redeemer, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we ask all of this. Amen. For those of you who have your Bibles, and if you don't have your Bibles, run and get one in your home somewhere. I know it's one in there. So I'm asking you to turn with me because I don't ever like for you not to hear the Word of God and be able to see it for yourselves and to know that this is God's word. We're going to the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. There's something interesting and just a few facts that I would like to give concerning the book of Hebrews. One thing, we don't know who the author is. We have no idea as to who it is. There has been alluded to that it could have been Paul, it could have been Apollos, it could have been Barnabas, Silas, different ones, but the authority of the writing of the book of Hebrews, there is no penned author that we know for fact is the author of this book. But one thing about it, it is wonderful to know. It was written to those of the Hebrew nation of people to have them to understand, and it's good for our understanding also that we might understand the grace of God, the knowledge as to what Christ tried to instill into those people after the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It was beautiful what is being said now because there were those in the Hebrew nation of people who were still caught seemingly between a rock and a hard place. And what I mean by that is this, Christ had died and he is the end of the law. But where there are those who are still believing and trying to equate this thing as to where they don't truly understand faith in Christ and understanding that salvation is through and by Christ and Christ alone. They don't understand that his blood has covered from all sin. They don't understand the fact that sacrificial offerings don't have to be made anymore at the temple in Jerusalem or at a tabernacle or a synagogue somewhere. They don't come, they have not come to the understanding that Christ entered the Holy of Holies behind the veil once and for all, sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat 
and now we have forgiveness of sins through and by the perfect lamb. Do you remember even in the days of when John the Baptist was out there baptizing, the Bible says, in the Jordan River, and when Christ came upon him, the proclamation that he made in that time was, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John had that idea, John had that vision, he had that uh, situation that's where the concept that he had embraced and he knew that it was true was that Christ was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And even during the three and a half some years that Christ was here, and he tabernacled among us, and the people saw him, and they saw even the miracles that he performed and all that he did to bring them to the knowledge of what grace was all about, they failed to realize who he actually was. A few weeks back, I spoke on that situation as to where I, uh, we understood together when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they gave different answers. And up until that point, he had only been known to his disciples by the name of Jesus. Now, what we fail to realize and what we really don't actually have in our mindset is that Jesus in that day and time was just as common of a name as uh, 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 John, Robert. It was just as common of a name as Jimmy, James, or whatever common names that there are today. I know that there are parents who are giving their children names and they're adding some things to it to make it sound a little bit more uh, stylish in this day and time. And those are names that will be here and we'll have to pronounce after I'm gone home to be with the Lord. And some of them I can't pronounce, but I just say, hey baby, how you doing? And I keep it moving because I don't want to offend anyone. But Jesus, that in that day and time was just as common of a name as the names that some of you and I grew up with of people who were around us. But when asked that question, who then do you say that I am? You remember it was Peter who jumped up and he said, thou art the Christ, the son of of the living God, it had to be revealed to Peter that he was the Christ. He was the Christ of God. He was God wrapped up in human flesh, incarnate in human flesh, and came to dwell among us. He was the one who John the Baptist said would take away the sins of the world. He was the one as to what Isaiah wrote about and said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. He is the Christ. He is the only means of being saved. Someone asked the question, can someone just be good and go to heaven anyhow without all of this other? No, you can't. You just can't. It's impossible. Unless you believe that he is the Christ. Good people die and go to hell, y'all. They did good all their lives. But if you do not accept the fact that Jesus is the only means of salvation, you'll die a good person. You'll die a good man, you'll die a good woman. It has to be that Christ is our means of salvation. 
What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean this. Being good is not a means of salvation. It's only through the blood of Jesus that we are saved. I want us to realize that. That is the reason this morning for our theme. Hope is our anchor. The book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is to where we study God's word together. Notice this. In the book of Hebrews, there are different warnings that are being given. There's a warning against drifting from things that we have just heard. There's a warning against disbelieving the very voice of Almighty God. There is a warning against degeneration from the elementary principles of Christ. There are warnings that's given against despising the knowledge of the truth of God's word. There are warnings against devaluing the grace of God. In other words, you're saying that grace does not apply or you don't need it in essence is what those are warnings that are being given throughout the book of Hebrews. We need the grace of God. We need the word of God. We need to understand that we must abide by the word of God. There are too many things that sometimes we've heard. There are even times that they've been quoted, but they're not scriptural. So we must abide by the word and heed the warnings. Go with me over to the sixth chapter of Hebrews now. Drop your finger down to verse 13. It says, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself, saying, blessing, surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Drop your finger down now to verse 19, and it states this, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. What is the essence of the message this morning for 152 years of ministry in the community. For 152 years, we've met Sunday after Sunday in a building somewhere. The previous buildings that have housed the congregation of Lake Providence, the previous buildings as to where the body of Christ has met. But remember, they were only buildings. The church is meeting this morning. And this is the anchor of our hope this morning. Our hope is anchored in the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is sure, and it's steadfast. What are you saying then, Pastor, about this, this, this anchor that we have in Jesus? In troubled times, we can depend on the Word of God. When troubled times have occurred, we know that we still have a God that we can cry out to, and He'll hear and answer our prayers. They're saying that this virus might not ever end. I don't know whether it will or won't, but one thing I do know, God is still in control, 
And as he is in control and he has this thing, it's in his hands, y'all. But my anchor, my hope is in Christ our Lord. This was such a difficult situation for the Hebrew nation of people to grasp on to because they were, as I said at the beginning, caught between a rock and a hard place. Where were they caught? Why do you say that they were caught? Because there were some, even after the death of Christ, who had come to the knowledge of who he was, come to the knowledge that he was the means of salvation. They thought he was a means, but they had not grasped hold of the idea that he was the only means. So therefore, there were those who went back to the temple and started sacrificing animals again. The priestly uh, royal priesthood of Israel was still in, in, enacted. They were still there at the temple, even after the veil split. And we remember that at the crucifixion. I believe that somebody went back down there and sewed that veil together again. But the Shekinah glory of Almighty God had already departed out of the Holy of Holies. Because why? Because Christ had been back there. Christ had sprinkled his blood. Christ had made the atonement for the sins of mankind once and for all. And it was through and by his blood that we came to this blessed hope as to where we can put an anchor and know it's going to hold and steadfastly secure and keep us. What do you mean? I'm secure in the fact that I know that it is by grace through faith that I have been saved, it's a gift of God, not of any works that I might do. Not that I might lift my name up or think I'm more than who I am, regardless as to what I may accomplish as far as life is concerned. I can't think of myself more highly than I ought to think, but I need to think soberly as God has dealt to every one of us a measure of faith. Thanks be to God for Jesus, our Lord, who died and he went behind the veil. See, the veil was a place as to where the whole, it was called the most holy place in the temple, in the tabernacle, when they tabernacled. The, the, the behind the veil was where the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant actually dwelt. And inside that Ark of the Covenant were the testimony, the commandments that God gave Moses on the mountain. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was the manna which stayed miraculously fresh that was in a bowl. Not only it was that, it was the third thing that was in there was Aaron's rod that budded was inside of the Ark of the Covenant, and it was sealed. And upon it being sealed, once per year was the priest allowed back there. And that was the time in which was Passover, and they went back there after they had sl slain a lamb. They could not enter that area unless they entered it with blood. And even though the priest himself knew that he was unworthy to be back there, he was sinful also, just like the rest of the people, but he had to get himself ready. He had to consecrate himself. He had to bathe. He had to go back there and offer a sacrifice for the behalf of the people and the atoning work that was done back there as he sprinkled that blood on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It was for the remission of sins, not only for the people, but for himself also. But he knew it was only good for one year. So therefore, 
these practices, these sacrifices, these rituals had to be done over and over and over again. But thanks be to God, he sent his son to enter the holy of holies, to offer a sacrifice on the behalf of his people that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm assured of my salvation through and by the precious blood of Jesus. As you study the book of Hebrews, I want you to remember as you study, there were those who lived in faith who believed and who knew that their anchor would be steadfast and sure. And out of the Old Testament, even as we understand when we get over to chapter 11 to talk about faith being the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, and we see all of our hall of famers of faith, those who walked by faith and not by sight, as we see all of those who held on to their faith to the end, believing that God would deliver, God would send a remedy for sin, God would send the perfect sacrifice for the behalf of God's people. We see all of those, Abel, I mean Cain, I'm sorry, Enoch, who walked with God, Noah, we see him, we see Abraham, we see Isaac, we see Jacob, and all of the hall of famers of faith. But then it comes down to a verse where it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. Have faith today. Believe that he is and believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's talking about seeking him with your whole heart. That's seeking him and knowing that besides him, there is no other. Lake Providence, we pray God's richest blessings upon you as we hold fast to the anchor that God has given this church family as we hope in the anchor, which is our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Continue to witness for him. Whatever way that God opens a door for you to witness to someone, witness to them of the goodness and the mercy of God. Let us pray. God, we're so grateful to you. You are our hope. You are our anchor. And for that, O oh Heavenly Father, we will be forever grateful that you have allowed us just to be witnesses of yours. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, that salvation has not been complicated, but is simply by grace through faith. We've been taught your word that if we confess our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, there's a promise. And that promise is, you shall be saved. Thank you, O oh Lord, that there are millions upon millions who discovered that one day, and now who are trying to tell the story of Christ. Father, continue to create within all of us clean hearts, that we may serve you to the utmost of our abilities. Bless us, Lord, bless homes, protect homes. Today, this week to come, and this year, as we are now in the last half of it. Father, help us 
as we continue to fight the good fight of faith. Bless us and keep us. That is our prayer. We ask it all in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you this week. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord give, lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you, church family. Come on, put those hands together. Give God some praise in here. For he's worthy to be praised. Can I get a witness in here?